without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to um, C of Claypot, uh, who is going to talk to us about five-minute practical streaming techniques which can save us millions. So I'm really looking forward to that one. Thank you. Thank you, Ghana, for the intro. Uh, super excited to be here. So my name is Z. Um, so today we're going to talk about optimizations. Um, before getting into the details, the fun part, uh, I want us to imagine a few different scenarios here. Right? The first scenario, um, you are in front of your laptop looking at you know, an online shopping retail website or a Netflix you know, website you know, trying to figure out, you know, after you type in a few searches, the website just magically kind of figure out what's your intent and give you the recommendations. So you happily you know, select the items, you know, watch the movie afterwards. That's the first scenario. The second scenario, um, you know, you ha after a long day of work, uh, you haven't realized you actually lost your credit card, right? You didn't realize that, but you got a you know, text message uh, telling you there's an unreasonably large amount of transaction that happened on your credit card. So you just type back no, decline that transaction, and you save the trouble for you know, dis uh, having to dispute the transaction at a later time. The third scenario, let's imagine you're one of the, uh, the customer support agent for one of the larger companies, right? Uh, so today there's a you know, customer coming, called you, uh, says that person actually made a transaction a couple minutes ago, and, but for some reason that person wasn't able to find you know, the order anywhere you know, on the website, so he called in, uh, asked you about it, right? So as a customer support agent, you, know, you try to look up the information here, but uh, unfortunately that information wasn't available to you. You know, as a software engineer, customer support, you, you, know, you, you had a gut feeling, you know, there's something tricky happening there. You know, maybe the, uh, the information that was available in the transactional side of the data store is just not available, not synchronized to the analytical part, which is you know, powering the customer support uh, you know, uh, tooling here. Right? So the reason why I'm bringing up these three different scenarios is because you know, there's a common pattern here. Right? Uh, it doesn't matter if it's driven by you know, a machine learning algorithm to give you a recommendation uh, decision, or it's a mental model, you know, a, a human that's driving the customer support decision here. Uh, the common pattern is if you don't have timely relevant information that feeds into the model, whether it's a mental model or a machine learning model, you know, it's going to be difficult for you to make a decision here, right? So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, you know, why the streaming pipeline, you know, is driving a lot of these machine learning use cases, and there's a lot of opportunity for doing optimizations. Um, so this pattern we have observed over and over again in the last couple of years with some of the larger tech companies as well. For example, uh, LinkedIn, in 2022, um, they shifted one of their, uh, you know, machine learning model for detecting bad actors, like bad bots online, uh, and just shift it from a batch feature you know, to streaming feature that resulted in 30% increase in that performance accuracy. Right? So you know, there are many other different examples here. I'm not going to repeat those. Uh, but we really do believe, and also the industry tends to agree with that too, streaming pipelines are the right approaches for you know, computing some of this relevant timely data to feed into the models. For a few different reasons. First of all, um, streaming pipelines tend to give you the ability you know, to bring data from disparate sources together, uh, you know, being the central nervous system of the entire architecture here. And secondly, you know, stream processing allows you to do um, you know, pre-processing using materialized view, which gives you that faster access to you know, computer results without having to kind of compute on the fly. Right. And then lastly, within the last few years, uh, streaming SQL is gaining a lot of momentum. So that is also opening up the audience you know, uh, to allow data scientists, uh, data engineers, even anal uh, analysts to be able to tap into the power of stream processing. So you know, um, given it's becoming more of a more of kind of practice in larger companies, uh, it's not uncommon for companies to spend millions or sometimes even tens of millions of dollars on streaming infrastructure like this, right? So for today's talk, we're going to talk a little bit more, more about, you know, especially as a user for some of this streaming infrastructure, if you use Flink SQL, you know, things like that, how can you optimize the cost for your company? So, so we're going to break the talk into three main sections. The first section, we're going to focus on talking about what is the goal for optimization, what's possible, what's not possible, what are some of the metrics you know, we can observe uh, to help us to understand. Right? Um, so I stole this chart from uh, Tyler from 20, his 2019 talk. So this chart is still largely relevant, uh, but in 2019, this was more focused on 
uh, comparing the differences between batch engines and streaming engines. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But the second part of this talk, uh, we are going to draw into you know, uh, more granular optimization within the stream processing you know, engine itself. The third part of the talk, I want to expand a little bit you know, to talk about uh, how does optimization work across a composable data architecture where you know, there's a lot of different engines you can work with. How do we perform optimizations across? So let's get into it. Um, to, in, order, in order to talk about optimization, let's start off by looking at the bigger picture here. right? Uh, so there are three different things we're going to be optimizing, um, latency, cost, and correctness. Uh, so what we're seeing here is uh, a modern architecture that sort of represents you know, the, uh, the feature engineering platform for a lot of companies. Right? So as data kind of flowing through uh, the microservices transactional data store into Kafka, you typically will need to have a data warehouse or data uh, you know, lake house to back up the raw data, just in case you, know, you need to do backfill. Right? Uh, and when you are ready to do processing, you know, whether it's actually bootstrapping a new real-time feature, or reprocess because of a, a bug, right? So you need to use engines like such as Flink or Spark to perform the optim uh, to perform the data processing there, uh, and the results will be emitted into online store uh, for online serving, uh, and also emitted into offline store for offline training purposes as well, right? Um, I want to talk a little bit more about the computation latency, right? We define the computation latency here as when the initial event reaches the engine and it starts processing until the point where you know, a result that's impacted by that one particular event is emitted you know, to either the online store or offline store. So you know, uh, for a lot of a stateless, you know, simple processing, uh, the latency would just essentially be you know, the transformation or aggregation you do on that event. But for some of the windowing events, uh, you know, it essentially represents the cadence of emission, right? So if you have a session window, uh, you know, the freshness of the results will be equal to, you know, essentially 50% of your session length there, right? Um, the online serving part is not going to be the focus of this talk, but I do want to kind of touch up a little bit on the, uh, uh, the backfill. Uh, so the backfill, the definition of backfill latency is when you need to go back in time to process the historical data. So the amount of time it takes to catch up uh, to, for a reasonable bound. So here are some of the metrics we can use to measure latencies. For computation latency, there is a latency marker you can enable in Flink that allows you to measure, you know, essentially for uh, within the string, there is going to be a marker being emitted as part of the string, and the marker is going to flow through all the operators, and you know, Flink engine automatically kind of captures uh, the latencies, you know, for uh, the lacing, uh, latency as it travels through all the operators. So the latency here is an estimation, you know, for summing all those latency of the marker plus the emission cadence we just talked talk about here. Another metric, uh, metric uh, we can use here is called event time like It's essentially capturing the current processing time minus the current watermark. That gives you a sense you know, how far away, how lagged behind the current processing is. Uh, the backfill latency, you know, we talked about it already, but one of the metrics you can look at is uh, what, what's the po uh, watermark progression uh, per work, uh, time, uh, clock time. Right? For example, you know, for every single one minute work clock time, you can process five minutes uh, of watermark time. That means you know, you're processing 5x uh, you know, the, the, water, uh, the work clock time. So this needs to be greater than one for your job to be able to catch up. So for cost, uh, the cost is divided into three different areas as well. There's data movement, storage cost, and computation cost. Uh, I think data movement and storage cost is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the computation cost here. Uh, computation cost is linear to two different things. One is uh, your processing loads, right? So since it includes your UDF, aggregation, transformation, that's all part of this uh, cost. It's also related to your uh, you know, state management costs that relates to your memory footprint, uh, that relates to your state backend IO uh, access, all that kind of stuff here as well. Um, so I put all these factors here, uh, but I'm not going to drill too much into it. So if you're interested in the details, you know, do feel free to pick up the slides at a later time, you know, just for us to save a little bit of time here. Um, 
I do want to talk a little bit more about how do we systematically think about uh, performing optimizations on workloads like this, right? Uh, the two things probably a lot of people care about is how do we speed things up? And second thing is, you know, how do we lower the cost? But before getting into the details, I also want to talk about keratinase, right? Keratinase is almost a given, right? Uh, you know, for large scale systems, we're talking about fault tolerance, resilience, you know, exactly one's processing, all that kind of stuff. Those are objective. But oftentimes, you know, when, uh, when we talk about keratinase, there's also a subjective, you know, uh, it depends on the actual use cases. You know, for example, for fraud detection, people probably care more about as transaction happens, keratinase needs to be more correct within the bounds of maybe one minute within the transaction, within the fraud happening. You know, if it's like an hour later, it's probably less, you know, important, right? So uh, going back to how do we speed things up, um, just systematically thinking about, it, about this, there are a few different options. Uh, you can use more power, scale up the job, use more concurrencies, you can process less. Oftentimes, you know, when talking about processing a job, there's a lot of redundant processing you can save. Um, and also, also oftentimes, you're waiting on a lot of uh, things, you know, for example, uh, waiting for IOs, how do you optimize, you know, to wait for less? Uh, and the last one is use better execution plan, right? So, you know, use better algorithms, picking the right joint algorithms and things like that. To lower the cost, we're talking about also doing less redundant processing uh, or store redundant things. Uh, and the second idea there is to use uh, more cost-effective hardware or technologies. Okay, so let's jump into the second part, which we're gonna have a hypothetical scenario here, uh, which we are going to talk about uh, a fraud detection situation. Uh, imagine yourself as a data scientist uh, working for a credit card company that we're in the process of building some features to feeding a machine learning model to do the prediction on whether you know, a transaction is fraudulent or not. Right? So, uh, and also imagine you know, we are data scientists here. Right? So uh, uh, the only tooling available to us is either Python or Flink SQL uh, for us to do this. So we're not gonna get into the details of you know, using Scala APIs or Java API for the purpose of this demonstration here. So the scenario is modeled after a uh, mid-sized fintech company uh, where we have about 10 million active credit cards, about 30% daily active cards, uh, one to two percent hourly active cards, you know, during peak. Uh, and also another important piece of information here, let's assume for every, on average, a normal credit card, you know, swipes about on average about 10 times a day, right? So if we do our math correctly here, uh, uh, we, uh, you know, we are going to see about like 350 transactions per second. But for the sake of this demonstration, we're gonna do 1,000 transactions per second just to prove the scale we can do, right? And also, uh, given one to 2% hourly active cards during peak, we're also going to see about 200K uh, unique credit cards within an hour boundary, right? These are important numbers, you know, we're gonna, uh, which is going to feed into our, our optimization decisions later. But what we're gonna do here is, uh, for every single one of those transactions, we're gonna feed a event uh, into Kafka. The schema is displayed on the right, right? Um, so let's take a pause here. Imagine we will actually compute a feature that, very simple, just taking an average of the transaction over the last two hours for every single credit card, right? The only constraint here I'm gonna add is, I want that computation to be, you know, the result to be ready no later than one second uh, when the event reaches Kafka. It's a very simple uh, computation here, right? Um, so take a second. If you have to write a Flink SQL like this, what would you write? So if you're like me, you know, uh, this is something I'm gonna write, All right? So let's dive deeper into it. Uh, so first of all, we're using a window table value function here, uh, which is specific to Flink. Um, window table value function, you know, also in short as TVF, uh, is at the center of grouping events uh, into windows so we can apply computation aggregations over infinite streams. And the second thing to notice here is we are using a hop window, which uh, another name for it is sliding window. Um, so there are a few different TVFs available in Flink, including hop window, tumble, tumbling window, uh, accumulating window, and also session window, right? But for this specific case we're talking about here, since we wanted to compute the aggregation over a two hour period, 
uh, but emitting events, you know, emitting the results no later than one second, right? So what we're doing here is uh, kind of describing the window, the hop window, to be two hour. That's the window slide. Uh, the, that's the window size, and one second will be the window slide, right? Um, because of the nature of this SQL here, we all, we can also see you know there's a group by class that group by on the credit card number, right? So since earlier we talked about you know the expected key space for this over a period of two hours is roughly about like two hundred you know thousand, right? So uh, the expectation there the, is the key space is going to be about two hundred thousand you know uh, uh, credit cards we're going to manage manage in the in the states, right? Um, and also another important factor to, uh, to consider here is uh, within each window, uh, how many events is going to be, you know, needs to be processed. We're doing a simple aggregation here, which is average, but it's important to look like how many events we need to compute over, right? Um, so take a guess, you know, well, I guess, you know, it's already on the screen. <laughs> how much money this is gonna cost you? It's a very simple job. Uh, and you know, per our benchmark, this is going to cost you about $8,400, right? So as a data scientist, uh, you, you write a simple query, you know, expecting it to run in production easily, and you probably didn't expect, you know, it's gonna cost you this much, uh, given it's not a high scale, uh, you know, uh, computation job here, right? So you might be raising the question here, uh, and your intuition might be right, right? So if we shorten the window, window slide to one second, that's probably the main cost for us to see a lot of this, uh, you know, computation cost, right? And I think you're right, but also there's another reason for this, right? So let's look at this one example here. Um, assuming W1 to W4 are the different windows, uh, that's, you know, kind of uh, with the cadence of the window slide, that's relatively large, right? Assuming we have events coming E1, E2, E3, E4, E5, coming in the sequence as depicted, uh, depicted in the picture here, right? So as E5 is reaching the computation engine, right? So uh, if you look back in time for a, a period of two hours, uh, E1 via E2 should be all included in this, you know, window. Uh, so the accurate computation when E5 reaches the pipeline should include all five events, right? But as you guys can see here, you know, none of the windows that's emitted here that can include all five events. So that will actually introduce some sort of inaccuracy, you know, for this part of the uh, computation here. So what can we do? You know, uh, we can compensate this by shortening the window slide, right? So uh, assuming we don't have a lot of events coming into the pipeline, you know, per credit card, because previously we made the assumption, you know, on average there's going to be uh, 10 events per credit card, right? So we can shorten in the slide to compensate this for this, so we can get better accuracy result. And this is very important, you know, for this one particular use case right here. Okay, so after understanding why we need to have the one second slide, uh, let's drill a little bit deeper into where you know, is the cost coming from, right? Um, so let's talk about how the windows are being materialized. So in Flink, a window is being created when the first event enters the pipeline. And, you know, since we have a slide of one second, for every single credit card, every single second, a new window is going to be created, right? So for a period of two hours, we're talking about 7,200 7, uh, windows being materialized just for a single credit card, right? Uh, and the window is going to be closed when the watermark hits the two hour mark, uh, you know, essentially reaching the window size. Um, so by mathematic, you know, uh, thinking here, uh, it's after the job entirely kind of materialized, uh, stabilized after a couple hours running the pipeline, we should expect about 200K emissions every single second, right? There's a lot of a computation, a, lot, a majority of them is actually redundant, um, you know, given the size of events in each window. Um, let's also imagine here, right? So let's imagine we have a perfect system. Every single aggregation takes one milliseconds to complete without having to wait. Uh, there's no IO, uh, you know. And since we have 200K key space, and, you know, uh, Every single one of them is gonna take one millisecond, so we're probably looking at about 200 cores or threads to support a job like this, 
that's a lot of CPU power to, you know, to do a sliding window with a small slide. Um, as we alluded to earlier, right, so it's also important to look at the state access here. For every single credit card, uh, you know, there's not going to be a lot of events, uh, but we're doing a lot of redundant computations here, right? But it's also important to realize uh, there's edge cases, right? So uh, there could potentially be a case where a fraudster uh, essentially, you know, grabbed the credit card and ran like 10,000 credit card transactions, you know, within the bound of two minutes. That's possible. So it's important for us to also design towards that, right? Um, it's unfortunately, you know, a lot of this, um, you know, capability is more available on the underlying, you know, Flink engine using lower level APIs. Uh, there are some techniques we can leverage here. You know, for example, uh, I think in 2019, 2021, there's a couple papers called Cuddy and Scotty that talks about how to leverage window slicing, you know, to avoid redundant processing. Not gonna get too much details into that, you know, but if you guys are interested, uh, look up online. There's also another paper called Railgun uh, from FISA, I think, you know, that was a company. They come up with a very interesting idea, you know, since a lot of this computation here is redundant, right? So uh, as the windows kind of moving across time, uh, really, you know, what's changing is the head and the detail, right? So they perform, you know, aggregation, uh, you know, for the middle part and only Combining, so you know, the middle part is less less likely to change. But as we kind of progress through time, you're only doing the computations of the head and tail, and then combine the results from the middle. So that's also another way. On the SQL side, there's a, you know ca kind of cascading SQL to allow you to do some of this type of optimizations. Uh, but the entire point here is um, when we look at a simple query like this, we have a couple knobs we can turn, right? So let's imagine. Uh, a situation where we want to build a feature. Now we're talking about, you know, the feature right now we're building is a two-hour window, right? But it's not uncommon to have a window size of one year, you know, for some of the fraud detection features, right? Uh, when we look deeper into that, so if we increase the window size, it's going to change two things, right? Uh, the longer the window, the more keys you're going to see, because uh, we talked about for, to simulate this company, there's like 10 million users. Um, Right? So if you increase the window from two hours to a year, for example, you're likely going to see you know, all 10 million uh, key space you know, uh, being computed as part of this job. Right? So that's one thing that's going to change. The second thing that's going to change is over a period of one year, we're not looking at you know, 10 events per credit card anymore. We're probably looking at what, you know, uh, if not thousands, probably you know, you know, tens of thousands credit card transactions you know, per year for a single credit card. Right? So because both things, you know, again, the key space and the number of events in each window is linear towards your cost. So we're going to see super linear growth, right, as we increase the window size here. So obviously that's not going to work for us, right? <laughs> uh, we're not going to be willing to pay millions of dollars for simple features like this. So what can we do? Um, you know, especially we're still bounded by using SQL, right? So uh, over aggregate, is a functionality that's available for Flink SQL. It's very different from TVF. Uh, you know, we talked about tumble window, hopping window, right? Over aggregation window performs very differently. You know, it's essentially performing the aggregation upon every event entering the pipeline. Then it go, goes back in time to order all the events for that credit card and perform the aggregation, you know, uh, kind of going back, you know, to our interval right here, right? Um, so the results shown on the bottom here is very similar. So you know it, it does perform, give you back the same results, but what's the main difference here, right? Uh, in previous example, the sliding window is going to emit two hundred thousand window firings every single second, and you know for this over aggregation window here, since we have one thousand transaction comes in, and we only need to perform a thousand uh, computations aggregations every single second here. So we should expect you know, to see a huge reduction in cost, right? And that's exactly what we see here. So we reduce from 8400 to about $70 per month. So that's pretty good, right? But there's always a catch. Um, so you know, by using over-aggregation, it actually introduces additional inaccuracy into the system, right? One example here is uh, assuming you know, uh, uh, over aggregation window fires when the event enters the pipeline. So we have W1 files when event 1 enters the pipeline. 
you know, similarly, you know, for all the other events. And uh, window five fires, you know, when uh, E5 kind of gets into the pipeline here, right? I want us to look at uh, this particular point in time right here, right? So as events leaving the window, we, you know, because the nature of over aggregation window is not firing the window again, that results in, you know, at this point in time, we still have the old results from when E5 was emitted, you know, window five was emitted, right? So we need a way to fix this as well. What can we do? So before we get into, you know, uh, how to use a SQL, Flink SQL to solve this problem here, right? Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, some other alternative, right? Obviously, using low level Flink API, there's many different ways we can solve this. Uh, you can implement custom window, for example. You can implement custom triggers. You can implement, you know, event time timer to essentially, the best situation to implement here is we want the window to fire both, you know, upon the event enters the pipeline and also upon the, uh, uh, the event uh, expires as part of the window, you know. So that way, you know, we can expect about 2,000 firings per second. You know, it's still relatively gonna be a lot cheaper than the, the sliding window and give us the accuracy we want, right? But unfortunately, custom trigger is not available on Flink SQL. Uh, and, you know, event time timer is also not available on uh, Flink SQL as well. So we are bound by our limitations here, right? So here's what we can do though. Oh, before getting into the details, I want to kind of show some benchmark number here. Uh, so comparing the sliding window with one second slide versus, you know, the over aggregation. Uh, so we're measuring the 95th percentile latency here. Uh, as we can see here, you know, even using about 224 cores, uh, you know, the pipeline is still about like 60 seconds delayed, right? Compared to, you know, over aggregation window, on average, we're seeing about 74 milliseconds, uh, you know, latency. You know, essentially means you get very fresh features out of this pipeline here. Uh, the cost is, you know, more than 100 times difference here, right? But also, the sliding window is trading off uh, cost for accuracy, while the over aggregation is trading off accuracy for cost. Uh, can we do better here, right? So, you know, it's essentially, what we're talking about here is between the two different sides of extreme, can we find some balances in between, between that extreme, uh, spectrum? So here's what we come up with, right? It's actually pretty simple, just kind of combine the two cores, uh, but given a knob of, kind of letting the users to choose what is the inaccuracy tolerance that users want, right? So it's a little bit harder to see, you know, for this query here, but, um, but the idea here is, you know, on the, on the top part, we have the over aggregate that, you know, does exactly the same thing, so we know we can get accurate emissions when events enter the pipeline. But we also using a sliding window of still two hours, but 60 seconds slide, to bound the arrow by 60 seconds. So we're gonna see a little bit kind of visual, uh, visualization here, right? The blue windows are over aggregation window and the yellow windows are sliding window here. So combining both, you know, using a union operator, uh, you know, as events kind of flowing through the pipeline, uh, I want, again, want us to kind of focus on this area right here, right? As E1 exit the window, since you know, we don't have a mechanism to fire the window at this point in time, but we also don't want the results to be wrong uh, for a long time. So what, we can, so what we're doing here is kind of combining the power of both over aggregation window and sliding window to bound the inaccuracy to be within 60 seconds. On average, it's gonna be like 30 seconds, right? Um, so this is what we can do to solve this particular problem by you know, performing the optimization. You don't have to pay like $8,400. Instead, you know, you're probably gonna be looking at fifty to hundred dollars, you know, for something like this, right? What do we learn from this? I think a couple of things. One is, um, as streaming is getting more and more mature, as streaming SQL is uh, getting more popularity, and obviously, um, you know, all the functionality available on the lower API is not fully available on the Flink SQL just yet, right? So we don't have those power yet. But also at the same time, you know, this tells us that, you know, as from the end user's perspective, you know, there's an opportunity for us to kind of capture what is important to the user. So what are the knobs the users want to uh, choose? And, you know, there's an opportunity for this data fabric layer to perform optimization on user's behalf to make things a lot easier for them, 
right? I want to kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, so that kind of uh, lets us to move into the third section here. I uh, want to talk about, about more advanced optimization techniques here, right? Um, I think a couple questions I want to address. Uh, you know, maybe before getting into those questions, this is a modern architecture kind of represents an application that has, you know, the transactional side of a backend, uh, which is the top side of this diagram here. We're talking about microservices uh, is backed by, you know, transactional data stores. On the bottom half of this diagram here, we have, you know, the analytical part of you know, data ecosystem, right? So we're talking about data warehouses, data lake houses, you know, having analytical stores to power real-time, you know, analytical use cases. And then there's this middle part where, you know, the streaming pipelines and, you know, the streaming infrastructure like Kafka and uh, Flink kind of serves as a central nervous system to connect both sides, right? The entire point here is uh, given there's a lot of different technology that's available in this entire ecosystem, and many of them is empowering the analytical reports, operation use cases, and more recently, you know, the AI and machine learning use cases as well, right? Um, given the complex ecosystem here, I want to answer two questions. One is, what does it take, you know, for us to have a, you know, more unified, more easier way to access all these data stores in a more cohesive fashion? And secondly is, um, I want to explore what are the opportunities when we work with a composable data infrastructure like this, uh, what are the opportunities to, to perform optimizations across the distributed systems like this, right? In order to answer those two questions, I think we need to uh, look at two of the foundational um, development in the last couple of years that can potentially make this possible. Uh, one, the first thing is, uh, the table to string duality that we talked about for many years already that allowed us to look into, you know, for a relational expression, right? So for those of you, you know, who are not familiar with a relational expression, it's not a new technology, right? So uh, for every single old database out there, you know, it uses a relational expression to, you know, relational algebra to kind of compute, uh, to declare the logic and being able to kind of do optimizations across this relational algebra and then apply to the different tables. Uh, but oftentimes, you know, in the past, this is only being applied to individual databases, right? But with the more recent development of table to string duality, that, you know, taught us on how to evolve the relational expression to also include some streaming semantics like watermark, like windowing semantics, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so what this allows us to do is once we have the relational expression, for streaming, you know, you can represent that for streaming, you can represent that for batch system, you can also represent that, you know, for transactional systems. Uh, you can, you know, that means we can have a way to translate the relational expression into SQLs, the different type of dialogue of SQLs, right? At the same time, you know, for a lot of the data scientists out there, they are very familiar with Python, they are very, you know, uh, familiar with the existing Python toolings like Pandas and things like that. So that also kind of give us an opportunity uh, to translate Python to relational expression and back and forth, right? So this is one of the, uh, the foundations that potentially make distributed optimizations possible, you know, especially for streaming part. The second thing, which is very, also very important, uh, is more recent development about data contract. Uh, data governance allows um, schema changes to be managed across different systems, right? So, you know, as we know, Kafka has a schema registry to allow you to manage schemas for your topic. Um, another example would be, you know, Apache Iceberg has very good implementation on schema evolution, right? So given those APIs allows us to be able to move data across different sy systems without, you know, when schema changes, it's not gonna break your system. So those are the two foundations, you know, for us to talk about what we can do here, right? On the high level, it looks like this. You know, once we have a workload declaration, we can translate that into IRs, right? The IR can be feed through, you know, unified processing here. And then underneath who, there's going to be a lot of different systems here, right? So we're talking about microservices, transactional data stores, the transports, uh, streaming transports, and data warehouses. Uh, I want to maybe use about three different examples to kind of dive deeper into um, obviously, we're not going to be able to kind of dive too much into details given the time, but I want to kind of give everyone some ideas uh, on what we can do here, right? So first of all, um, I want to explore this idea about distributed pr predicate push down or push up. Uh, let me use an example here. Um, 
I know the arrow is there, but I want to start the example right here using you know, maybe Apache Iceberg as an example. So uh, Apache Iceberg uh, implements a two-layer metadata uh, you know, kind of management layer, right? So what this means is Apache Iceberg will be able to allow you to perform very uh, you know, efficient uh, partitioning, uh, filtering, uh, you know, based on you know, you query for specific you know, metadata information, you know, kind of gives you back the file, and then you can uh, pull those data and then you know, perform processing, right? Um, one specific use case is gonna enable you to do is as data scientists, you know, since I have the ability to pull data from Iceberg, for example, you know, I wanted to experiment a new feature, but I don't need the full set of data. I only wanted to experiment a feature over like 1% of the users. I can use those metadata layer you know, to retrieve only 1% you know, of the data, and that will potentially fit into the memory for my local Python notebook. Now I can perform that optimization, uh, I mean computations over a pandas data frame, right? So that's one thing uh, that they can do without actually having to deploy the job into production and wait for the results that speeds a lot of things up for data scientists. I want to push the idea a little bit further, right? So since we can do predicate push down to iceberg, you know, what if we have a situation where you know, there's petabytes worth of data logs being generated in your microservices environment? You know, Majority of those logs is not going to be useful to you, right? So you're not going to spend the money to store them in your data warehouse. But what if you need to do live ad hoc debugging? What if you need to, you know, perform, you know, customer service support for a specific user? So what if you have a similar approach that, you know, a protocol implemented on your microservices site allows the processing to push that predicate, you know, filtering for one specific user, and that microservice is only going to push you those specific. Uh, events so we can do very targeted processing, right? Again, you know, the, the, the saving we're talking about here is instead of saving, uh, you know, storing petabytes worth of data in your microservices, you can do things ad hocly. You know, instead of spending, you know, millions every single month, we're spending cents <laughs> on a daily basis here, right? So that's um, distributed predicate push down or push up. Secondly, I uh, want to talk a little bit more about unified streaming data lake calls. Um, so Apache Kafka is becoming more and more popular in terms of uh, being the streaming transport, right? Uh, another example here would be also, you know, Apache Iceberg is also becoming more popular as, you know, a streaming data warehouse. So there's an opportunity to kind of being able to get both engines to work together. Uh, you know, there are many cases around performing backfill because Kafka is, has limited retention, right? So what if you store the raw data also in Apache Iceberg? So when you need to perform the, uh, the backfill, you can go back in uh, Apache Iceberg to retrieve data efficiently and perform the computation. And when the right time arrives, you can switch back you know, to Kafka. So that enables that sort of a uh, use case to also um, as well. And the, the cost here is you know, underneath the hood for Apache Iceberg, you're essentially just storing um, you know, parquet files on S3. So the cost is likely going to be about like 100 times less compared to Kafka, right? Another example here will be uh, when we're talking about machine learning use cases where it's very important to, you know, generate accurate training data set, right? So just a little bit of context here. For training, uh, for generate training data set, you need the inference timestamp, right? Uh, you also need the labels that you generated later along with those inference timestamp, but you need to join that data with the, the in-the-moment uh, feature to, in order to generate the training data set, right? Well, why is that important? Because, you know, if you use any random, uh, so this is, you know, where the time travel kind of comes in play, right? Uh, so in the traditional world where, you know, you are, let's say you're gener generating the training data set on a daily basis, it's very easy, you know, to do a bucket join using Spark, uh, you know, to, to be able to join those two sides of things together, right? But what if in the future we want to kind of move into a world of continuous training where, you know, because of the model might drift, your features might drift, as soon as you detect that, you want to kind of use the latest data to, uh, to, to perform the training data set generation again, right? So what that means is, you know, we're shifting into a world of joining the streaming side of things towards your batch features. Right? So that requires, instead of doing uh, bucket joins, we're probably looking at you know, using watermark uh, on available on the batch tables uh, you know, in order to join with your streaming data set as well. So that's also additional 
uh, optimizations in the future we can potentially do. And lastly is, uh, want to talk a little bit more about this composed by unified processing, right? So oftentimes in the past, we talked about segregating between the batch and streaming, but really I think, you know, in my mind, it's, I think we alluded to this earlier already, it's really about picking the right algorithm, you know, to perform the computations, whether it's a bucket join between, you know, two, uh, you know, two batch data sets or, you know, using watermark to join a stream to batch table. Um, I think, you know, the entire system is gonna evolve towards that. Um, and also another important factor here is oftentimes we kind of, you know, uh, as I would imagine a lot of us kind of comes back from the background of a backend computation, right? So the engines available to us are, you know, Spark and streaming engines like Flink, right? But oftentimes, you know, we might have neglected a lot of the, the data scientists that actually use very different engines like Python, uh, like Python Pandas, right, or uh, DocsDB. I think a unified processing here also means, you know, how do we uh, get the underlying data system to work with different engines together. I think uh, by, again, alluding to earlier, uh, when we have a relational expression tree allow us you know, to distribute different workloads to different engines, work with different storages, a lot of this might become possible. So uh, we're almost out of time here, but the last point I want to make here is a modern data fabric for machine learning can benefit from intelligent, distributed, yet intuitive optimization layer. And that concludes my talk here. Uh, I think we have a